Hi everybody, Stefan Molyneux from Free Domain back with our good friend Mike Cernovich and we are going to talk everything sorted, everything detailed, everything explosive, sex crimes potentially at the highest levels of society, cover-ups, prosecutorial deals that would make the devil hang his head in shame and at the center of it, uh, along with the Miami Herald, is the aforementioned Mike Cernovich. Mike, thanks so much for taking the time today. Let's get the backstory out for people who haven't seen this trail of tears. Yeah, this is bizarre. And it's a lot of like a lot of things in life. I jump into things that I should not have maybe gotten myself into. And I got a call from my lawyer, oh, December 2016. So two and a half years ago. And he said, hey, there's this lawsuit that was filed under seal. It's kind of peculiar. You want to have me file it for you? I'll just charge you a flat fee like $10,000, and maybe there's something there, maybe there isn't. I think, okay, sure, that's interesting. Let, let's do it. Involve Jeffrey Epstein and have some interesting angles. And I said, sure. So I filed the lawsuit. Should it should be an easy win? Because for those of you who don't know at home, in America, if you file a lawsuit in federal court, that's public. You can't say, well, you can't look at what's in the documents. You can do what's known as a limited redaction. So if your social security number or credit card number or something is a part of it, you can take a black magic marker and redact that. But you're in a public courthouse. These are judicial records. The public has a right to see them. This is black letter First Amendment freedom of the press law. Well, and it's a way of allowing for accountability and external review over the judicial system itself. So yeah, it's First Amendment, and if you file, if you use the public court system and you file stuff in the public court system, I think the assumption is you're only filing it because it's gonna affect your case in, in some manner, and therefore it's gonna be subject, should be subject to the review of outsiders, and in particularly of reporters. So this is clear precedent going back, way back to common law. Yeah, it's the common law has been hundreds of years. That's the general rule. And everything that we, tried to find, it would just say redacted. So for example, a motion for summary judgment would be, be maybe 250 pages with exhibits. You would only see in the court records one page bracket redacted. This is not what you would ever see in a civil lawsuit. This is the kind of stuff that you would see in a national security prosecution against a terrorist where there are state secrets. It didn't make any sense. It's really bizarre. I filed um, a lawsuit to get the records. I lost, and then I appealed, and then I kind of got quiet about it because I was told by multiple people in the national security community, they said, you don't have any idea what you got yourself into. Uh, this was not a good idea of you to do, and we've inter intercepted some chatter about you know conversations about how you're in danger. So I quit talking about it. So people will remember I filed this motion and then I lost, I appealed it, and then I just shut up about it because I was told that I was facing credible threats. What threats? I, they said they couldn't tell me specifically, but they told me that Epstein was much more involved in things than people knew. And I go, oh, okay, that's a little creepy. These are very serious people telling me this, so I quit talking about it. Well, lo and behold, thank God, whoever knew I would be thinking the, the mainstream media, I won't even call them the fake news media, I'll, I'll say I will give credit where it's due, a reporter named Julie Brown of the Miami Herald filed a lawsuit trying to unseal the records that I had sought. So then I, I was had a green light to talk about it now, because if it were just me, I was in a lot of danger and I was told just to kind of lay low a little bit. But then the Miami Herald got tipped off to it and they filed a motion just like I'd filed to unseal it and get the records. And then it, she's just made it her investigative journalistic um, journalism project to get these records. The judge also denied their motion, which is interesting in a number of reasons. One is, it's one thing to say, Mike Cernovich, he's a troll. He just wants these records because that's what he's a troll and blah, 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 blah. But in the coverage of that, the Reporters for Committee for Freedom of the Press filed what's known as a friend of the court brief to the Second Circuit saying that I should have won below. So but and th so that you know buttressed my case. And then when the Miami, Miami Herald was in it, the judge denied them and said, you lose too. They appealed. So then our appeals, the legal term is called consolidated. So the Miami Herald, my case was on appeal. And then the judges said, oh, well, the Miami Herald, they just lost and they're going to appeal. We'll just have them all heard together. So Mike Cernovich, the Miami Herald, were in a 
case together, which is very weird and very surreal. And I'm sure they feel um, <laughs> just the same about that, too. But t- here we are. Now, let's do a little bit of a, a zoom out in, into the backstory. So Jeffrey Epstein, this Palm Beach multi millionaire was accused, I guess, fairly long ago now of he had a, a, a big cult like cult like network of underage girls. So he had young female recruiters and the accusation was that he was coercing them into having sex acts in his waterfront mansion. And this uh, was, was it 01 to 05 or something like that was where this was uh, going down because one of the girl's parents found out about it and, and reported him and so on. And it looked like, you know, from sort of any objective standpoint, they had dozens and dozens of girls all with the same story. It wasn't just, you know, he said, she said, one person in a closed room. They had descriptions of the house, descriptions of his genitalia. They had the whole thing. And it seems like they kind of had him dead to rights. And there was a whole trafficking investigation going on at the federal level. And then, and then, and then, there just seemed to be this big, massive intervention and we're going to talk about why but how did it play out in terms of the prosecution okay and and i'm glad you zoomed out because you're right this is utterly bizarre i'm i whenever we talk i always try to think in terms of what if i were listening and then as we're talking i think of well what if the listener doesn't know what this means or that means and you do the same and i think that's why people are enjoying conversations at least when they think i'm on my phone kind of a segue i I remember people uploaded a video of us on a panel and i was on my phone and all the comments are saying how rude i am (laughs) but i was talking to nypd about antifa like trying to kill people yeah so it's it's always i I pointed that out number a number of times to people who were watching the video like yeah he's he's trying to get people not killed by people out Right. Side threatening bullets. Yeah, so I always thought that was funny. But that digression as it is, I'm thinking in terms of, right, this, the, so the Epstein thing, he was known to have this kind of, at first it was thought of as like a party island. Hey, he's a rich guy. He's a financier. By the way, nobody knows how he got rich or can explain how he got rich. And we can talk about that maybe a little bit later on the podcast. But there's a, it was actually a listener of yours I, who, of, who found me from your show. And I was talking and they said, oh, yeah, we actually they told me this two or three years ago. They said we actually were neighbors with Epstein and then he sold this building for like 10 times what it was worth. And everybody in his peer group said they can't understand how he got rich. Hmm. So there are so many layers to this Epstein case that it is like true detective where people are saying that nobody knows how he got rich. They can't explain it. He claims he had a family office, but it was kind of like Madoff. Nobody knew his trades. Like, how was this guy? I, I think he might be a billionaire. I mean, he's very, very, very wealthy. Could be a billionaire. It never made sense. So literally people who watched us together, grew up around him. And that was always the chatter amongst the 10 or $20 million class, which is, hey, you know, Epstein should be a 10 or 20 million heir like us. How in the heck did he end up with hundreds of millions or maybe a billion? And then they looked into deals that didn't make sense. So I was having lunch lunch with a very, very well-connected guy, and we were hanging out, and it was a very free-flowing, ask-me-anything kind of conversation. And then I said, hey, man, this is kind of out of the blue, but I was told that Jeffrey Epstein did some like real estate deal and nobody really knows what that means and what what is that? And the, the person got very silent and said, well, Michael, in this town, we've learned there are some things that you just shouldn't ask. And that ah, happens so the free flowing one- discussion kind of hit a, bit, a dam of concern. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So whatever it is, I, and that's where the thing, I don't know what it is, but everybody's kind of had that question, like, how did he actually make his money? It doesn't make any sense. Now, the reason I bring that up is because what I'm about to say sounds really insane and it sounds like a conspiracy theory. But the, the theory goes that, that Epstein got the deal that he got because he was running a major blackmail operation at his party island. So he would fly people down. There were cameras everywhere. He would film royalty, former presidents, you name it, in all kinds of acts, some of whom with girls maybe 15, 16 younger. It, it wasn't ascertained exactly how young some of these people are. Julie Brown's report in the Miami Herald did indicate that there were 14-year-olds. So it wasn't, you know, she was 17 years and nine months kind of deal. We're, you know, we're talking eighth grade freshman in high school. Sort well, of also, just to point player. out that in Florida, 
not knowing how old the underage girl is is not a defense as far as I understand it. So uh, it, it doesn't matter. Oh, she looked, you know, Randall Patrick McMurphy style. She looked 18. It doesn't matter. Yeah, statutory rape is what's known as a strict liability defense. So, uh, uh, offense. So, um, and if an underage girl gives you an ID and it says she's 21 and she looks 25 and she's 16 and the age of consent is 18, sorry for you, it doesn't matter. There's literally no defense. It's strict liability. It doesn't matter if you took every precaution possible. So they would all go party at Jeffrey Epstein's place. And as I looked more and more into the case, I saw things that I did not believe. People would send me things. And I'm super paranoid after I got framed for the whole P gate thing, right? So I'm like, actually, anytime I get anything that looks a little weird, I'm like, look, you guys aren't going to claim that I'm saying something I'm not. But I found drone footage of his island, and there was some weird, like, temple thing. And again, it looks I've unbelievable. I've seen a picture of that. Yeah, it's yeah. a little freaky. So I went back and I go, this can't be real. This can't be real. And then I saw the date on the website was a drone footage thing. And this is before Epstein was like a big deal. So it was more like, oh, we flew our drone. Look at this building we saw on this island in the Virgin Islands or whatever. And it looked like there was like a subterranean thing to it. Nobody really. So the whole thing is weird. That's that's why I'm bringing this up. It really does feel like some true detective kind of stuff. And any angle you look at it's weird. How do you get all this money? Why did Bill Clinton go down there multiple times without Secret Service detail? Prince Andrew was connected to it. So the British royal family is connected to it. What, what is this weird building that you can find drone footage of that was taken years ago? Why is nobody looking? There were videos and um, or articles in the Daily Mail where there's like a dental chair at, at the, his island, like teddy bears. So were kids being harmed or maybe single moms brought their kids? I don't know, man. All I know is anytime you look into this, it, it feels not real. It's one of those – it feels like a conspiracy theory. You're like, this can't possibly be true. This is the weird, you know, crazy things people talk about on the internet. But then you find out, no, Prince Andrew was connected. Prince and uh, Bill Clinton was connected. The deal that he got, he never should have got. Oh, he oh, okay. wasn't – So, yeah, we'll get, get to the deal in a sec, but I just – this is from the Herald. I looked sort of some of stuff. I read some of the briefs before we were chatting. And the Herald says, the Herald also identified about 80 women who say they were molested or otherwise sexually abused by Epstein from 2001 to 2006. About 60 of them were located now scattered around the country and abroad. And then eight of them agreed to be interviewed on or off the record. Four of them are willing to speak on video. And a lot of them are saying that was my life before Jeffrey Epstein and then was my life after Jeffrey Epstein when everything just went uh, absolutely uh, terrible. And uh, it, it really is appalling. I mean, this is just 80 that could be found. And again, I'm no lawyer, but they seem to me, based upon the descriptions of what, the, uh, of what they've seen that I've read, pretty credible. I mean, the stories all align with each other, and it's not like they all had a chance to coordinate. So this is a truly nasty den of degeneracy and vice. And it took a long time for him to get cornered, and then, like you think that's appalling enough, and then the DA and, and others take this path that, you know, to my amateur outside eyes, Mike, goes against a wide variety of laws, of statutes, and of just basic common human decency. Once they've got this guy uh, cornered, it would seem they were having dead to rights. You got dozens and dozens of underage girls testifying. It's straight up. Um, there's evidence uh, uh, from his flight logs to place him at the right place uh, when he's supposed to be there. And it just seems like not exactly open and shut. It's like there's video footage of it, but as close to it as you could possibly get. Yeah. And, and this is, again, why if I were listening to this podcast, I would think that this was two insane people talking because nothing about this case is real, but you can confirm and verify everything in, in very reputable sources. So Jeffrey Epstein, they got the goods on him. There's, I don't know, 13 women, 14 women, some large amount of women, a number of them underage. They got the goods on him. This is state and federal charge. So if we have a free domain radio listener who's 20 and he's dating a 17-year-old girl and she sends him a nude selfie under federal law, that's child pornography, period. Sorry for you, five-year mandatory minimum sentence. That's just the, the way it is. Well, with Epstein, you had all of this and more. You had the international trafficking. There's something called the Mann Act, which is that if you fly someone under 18 across state lines, then that's considered international sex trafficking. This is all well-established laws. So Florida state prosecutors had him. The feds had him. 
And the feds were doing a whole sex trafficking exploration because this guy might just be one node in a whole network. Exactly. And this is why, again, we're in true detective. It's very bizarre. The feds then say, well, we're not going to prosecute him because the state is prosecuting him. But the state sentenced him to jail, but he got to leave jail six out of seven days a week to go to work, to go to his office. All right. So, so yeah. Did. So let's um, let's have a look at this. So there was uh, this again from the uh, Miami Herald. I'll put the links below. Despite substantial physical evidence and multiple witnesses backing up the girl's stories, the secret deal allowed Epstein to enter guilty pleas to two felony prostitution charges. Epstein admitted to committing only one offense against one underage girl who was labeled a prostitute, even though she was 14, which is well under the age of consent, 18, in Florida. Now, I just really want people to understand this. There is no such thing as a child prostitute. A, a prostitute is somebody who's of age. If you are underage, you can't be called a prostitute. It's child sex trafficking. It's a whole different thing. But she was called a prostitute, as far as I understand it, in this plea deal. And uh, and moreover, and moreover, because that's what I mean, the, the layers you peel back, um, if you, it's called victim's rights statutes. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. If, if you're accused of harming a child or an underage girl, or even uh, if it's a date rape situation, under the law, you have to, the prosecutors have to come to the victim and say, hey, we're about to negotiate this deal with the accused assailant. And here's the deal. If you don't like the deal, you have a right to tell the judge. But ultimately, prosecutors have final authority. And, and they, you get to show up to the actual sentencing and, and yeah. be there and hopefully get your case in or something. And they hid it. They didn't tell the women. Right. They hid, they hid that from them. Complete, complete violation of prosecutorial norms, violation of the law. Literally, it was lawless. And it, and it goes against everything you're trained to do as a prosecutor. It became this like top secret thing. And then meanwhile, not only that, but then the federal charges were dismissed. And then he's sentenced to jail, but he doesn't really spend his time in jail like everyone else. He's able to leave and banter about all day, and he just comes in and spends a night in jail. It's, it's again, unfathomable. It's, it's incomprehensible. Well, and as we all know, convicted sex offenders have a pretty rough time of it in prison. Again, this is from the Miami Herald. Epstein didn't face any kind of rough justice. Right. Instead of being sent to state prison, Epstein was housed in a private wing of the Palm Beach County Jail. Boy, if that's not an aptly named club fed, I don't know what is. And he says, uh, they go on to say, and rather than having him sit in a cell most of the day, the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office allowed Epstein work release privileges, which enabled him to leave the jail six days a week for 12 hours a day to go to a comfortable office that Epstein had set up in West Palm Beach. This was granted despite explicit sheriff's department rules stating that sex offenders don't qualify for work release. Well, of course they don't qualify for work release. They're sex offenders. Yeah, right. So anytime you look at this case, you're, you're seeing things that just don't add up. You're seeing things that are lawless. And that's been the MO of everything involved. And not to fast forward too far, but uh, you know, Julie Brown, her Twitter account, she made a good point about all this. And she didn't quite phrase it this way, but I did, which is the where are the Republicans and the Democrats rushing to that microphone to talk about this hor horrific deal that Epstein got? This is red meat. You want to talk about a rush to the microphone? No Democrat, no Republican in Florida is out there demanding answers. And what, what people don't want to say, but what I believe is Epstein, I think, has information on everybody. He was mm. running a blackmail operation. Every Democrat, every Republican in, in political office in Florida, either they're implicated or else somebody they know is. Otherwise, again, this is easy. P you want to talk about like easy PR wins? Hey, this is it. You know, where's the press conference with Marco Rubio, <laughs> right? Let's get let's get with the Dade County Sheriff and let's bring everybody in. Hold the can't believe this happened. Miscarriage of justice. No, no. And you no, get to stand with the victims in the Me Too right. movement. Like, where are these girls, these children, in the Me Too movement? I'm just going to set the stage a little bit more. Then we we'll get on to to what happened, right? So this again, Miami Herald. The girls, mostly 13 to 16, were lured to his pink waterfront mansion by Wild and other girls. The girl who worked for him. 
who went to malls, house parties, and other places where girls congregated and told recruits that they could earn $200 to $300 to give a man, Epstein, a massage, according to an unredacted copy of the Palm Beach police investigation obtained by the Herald. The lead Palm Beach police detective on the case, Joseph Riccari, said Epstein's operation worked like a sexual pyramid scheme. And this broke my heart, Mike, I'll tell you straight up. This Miami Herald says, most of the girls came from disadvantaged families, single parent homes, or foster care. Some had experienced troubles that belied their ages. They had parents and friends who committed suicide, mothers abused by husbands and boyfriends, fathers who molested and beat them. One girl had watched her stepfather strangle her eight-year-old stepbrother, according to court records obtained by the Herald. So, I mean, he's scooping in some of the most hurt children in the vicinity and uh, bribing them and uh, eventually just uh, corrupting them uh, beyond recognition, according to what the girls say. Yeah. And this is broadly speaking too. why, if you believe in broken homes, I, this is my belief that uh, there's a big movement among people on the left to destroy the nuclear family because that creates an entire class of vulnerable victims. Well, yeah, the statistics are very clear on this, that if you uh, come from a home with a single mother, you're over 30 times more likely to be abused. Why? Because there are all these low rent, trashy guys moving through the uh, the uh, usually low rent apartment uh, with easy access to children. You know, like you're a dad. I'm a dad. We're not having a bunch of guys sleeping over at our house with our kids around. It's not happening. But if you're a single mom, it happens with depressing regularity. Well, and that and so if you want to destroy families, then you do you create an entire class of vulnerable people. Yeah. And th- that's why a lot of what's happening in society makes a lot of sense if you just realize, if you look at what happened with Epstein, this is just pure evil. This is, yeah. uh, whether you call it demonic or whatever you know religion people have or whatever, however you just describe evil, this is evil. This isn't a, a bad joke on Twitter. This isn't a, a podcast gone amok. He, this he didn't misgender Donald someone. Trump. Yeah. yeah, you didn't misgender someone. This isn't Jordan Peterson refusing to call someone by certain pronouns under penalty of the law. This isn't Donald Trump in the Access Hollywood tape. This is pure evil. This is people finding women who are down and out, 13 or 14, grooming them and then trafficking them around the world and making them the playthings of the rich, probably drugging them. This is pure evil. And there was just not that much interest in it amongst the media. So again, in terms of the story, I was leading the charge. People didn't really care all that much, but then they found out a Trump angle. Hmm. Alexander Acosta is now the labor secretary. Alexander Acosta was the United States attorney in Florida when this deal happened. So even though Acosta as much as he's fair game, as far as I'm concerned for criticism, he, I don't know how much of it he actually knew or supervised. It's such a, you know, you're, you're the U.S. attorney. Was he actually really super involved? We don't know. But then the media says, hmm, now we have a way to bludgeon Trump. So now we really, really, really care about what happened to all, you know, these poor girls. Hmm. Like, what? well, th- wh- where was all of this concern? And by the way, that isn't Julie Brown and the Miami Herald. I think they really do care. But I'm talking about what you call verified Twitter or resistance Twitter. Half of what they say, they don't even care about Epstein. Oh, Trump's labor secretary did this or Trump this, Trump that. They don't even really care about the women that are not even women. I mean, the girls that were abused by Epstein and his people. Yeah, no, it is. It is absolutely appalling. So they did this deal. The guy had some severely reduced charges. Now, I've also heard some rumors that he may have given some evidence in some prosecution of financial crimes in sort of the 07, 08 crash, but I don't think it ever played out. I don't think there's any confirmation of that. I'm just pointing out something that I've, I've heard of. He gets this unbelievable sweetheart deal, um, spends almost no time in prison, just has to sleep there most of the time, gets out, and then he, what, he goes to New York, and he's like, oh, you got to reduce my classification of, of being a sex offender. And uh, it's really, I mean, you got to give the guy credit for chutzpah, if not any decent sense of morality at all. Yeah. And then he's able to fly internationally. He just he's living the life. It's as if his life hasn't changed at all. Now, he does occasionally have lawsuits he has to pay out. He's paying out $4 million here, $5 million there. Again, where is he getting this money? How does he have all this money to fly private? What are his actual investments and holdings? None. Of it, where he gets his money is to me. By well, I mean, I don't want to say the most interesting, but the the most 
we know what he did to the women. We know what he did to the girls. Who was involved? But where did he get his money? That is the Pulitzer stuff. That is the stuff that nobody else is asking about. And in fact, that my friend told me was a very dangerous question to ask and this not the kind of thing to ask. And this is also why I was told to back away from the case until the Miami Herald ended up becoming the Calvary. Believe it or not, what a, what a strange world. And what, a, what a weird thing for me to say, but I have to speak the truth. And, and that really is the truth. I think they saved my life because what are you going to do? What are they going to go after everybody now? Right? There's, there's too many of us. So I was, I was reading through the briefs and well-written and, and I can follow most of it. There's a, a certain amount of area where it becomes a bit confusing to me just because of the names. I was hoping you sort of clear it up. So there was a defamation suit that was filed in this because I think one of the women was called a liar. One of the victims was called a liar. And then she sued. And then some yes. of that was redacted for privacy concerns, even though the woman who was suing said, I'm fine. I mean, I'm already out there as a victim. What have I got to lose? Uh, so help me sort of understand how that is playing out in the larger lawsuit universe. Right. This is why when you before you go to law school, you got to take an LSAT and the LSAT will say, a set next to B and B was four chairs away from C. And that this case really is a mind uh, screw. So the woman um, is called Giselaine versus Maxwell. So the one, one of the one will just say A and B. Woman A claims I was a victim of woman B. Woman B was the madam and she would bring all these women from Jeff Epstein, man C. Woman B says, how dare you, woman A, say that about me? You're a liar. You're a fraud. I did nothing of the sort. Woman A says, well, you've called me a fraud and a liar. That's defamation. Therefore, I'm going to sue you. Now, if you're a defamation lawyer, you know that that's a thin defamation suit. People call you a liar. I mean, people call us, you know, all that and worse. And N never heard of that, Mike. That's that's a news to me. But I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to look it up after the conversation. <laughs> yeah. So so it, 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 it's a thin defamation case, but it's enough of a hook now to sue the woman to bring her into the case. And defamation. So now you have her sued. So now woman A sues woman B for defamation. Jeffrey Epstein's man C. And then you got, you know, Bill Clinton, Prince William, and God knows who many else's DEs and Fs. So, you, so the part of the defamation, you can say, well, hey, woman B, you said that you weren't a madam. I'm going to subpoena your records. How many times were you with Epstein? Where did you hang out? I'm going to get your bank records. Did he ever send you money? Where were you? Are there pictures together? So you get all that discovery. That discovery is if you're an investigative journalist, that's like the whole, potentially it's like the holy grail. That's every connection, every person who hung out with, with Epstein and all these other people. But it's all redacted, so nobody knows what's in there. Could it be? It could be that I spent all this time and money in a in a cause. It's like Al Capone's vault or whatever, and <laughs> you, you get the vault and there's nothing in there. But I'm not the only one who thinks there's a lot of stuff in there. So that's the defamation case. Now, and, and just just to give people a sense, because we talked earlier, Mike, about how you know your address, your social security number, and maybe I don't know if someone has an affair. Uh, the, the person they had the affair with who's not really part of the lawsuit, you could redact that. And it doesn't really have any bearing on the truth or falsehood of the case. So there can be some reasons to redact, as you point out, sort of national security and so on. The level and scope of the redaction in this area is almost beyond belief. I mean, it, it, is, it is literally like just swaths of black ink being fired out like a cannon at a whole bunch of legal briefs. And there's, you know, dozens of documents. There's like countless pages where it's just like black, 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 black. Yeah, they, it's, full, it's a full redaction. It is unprecedented. That's why, you know, to use an overused word and to use it inaccurately, but that's literally not how the courts work. <laughs> In a, in a civil lawsuit, you literally can't redact everything. That's the kind of thing a, a first-year lawyer would say, I'm just redacting everything. No, you, you literally can't do that. That's not how any of this stuff works. The whole case file is redacted. What is in there could potentially be damaging, and I'll tell you why, because there's another twist in the case. So we're on appeal. Second Circuit Court of Appeals is saying the Miami Herald's right, Cernovich is right. We're going to unseal the records unless you can give us a good reason why not by March 19th. So woman B files a motion saying everything has to be sealed. It wasn't persuasive. Nobody really took it seriously. But then John Doe comes in 
and files an amicus curiae brief. And he says, whoa, 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 you got to keep these records private because I'm in them, probably. But I'm not going to tell you who I am because I'm a John Doe filing. And I don't know for sure that I'm in there, but I probably am. And because I'm in there, I need to see what's in there so that I can redact myself out of there. Now, but that and, could just be a redaction of the name while the general patterns of the case remain clear, right? Well, yeah, but even then you don't get to do that. You don't get to file an amicus brief. An amicus brief is a friend of the court brief that says, your honors, I have a unique insight into the law and I want to share this unique insight or point of view of the law. This person is essentially saying, I might be in there. Holy crap. You need to let me see that so you can redact it. That's hmm. not a friend of the court brief. That's a self-interested brief. And moreover, even if you're in there, uh, tough titties. You're, <laughs> Wait. So what? You're I, I'm in there. I'm going to need that legal argument in the original Latin, Mike. But yeah, tough right. titties, right? Yeah, yeah. Wild, wild country, I think, is where I got that from. Tough, tough titties. <laughs> Sheila would always say tough titties. And that, that really is the answer. Yeah, you might have been named in a court document. Tough, tough titties that doesn't matter, your stuff can st can still come out. And moreover, the person's a John Doe, nobody even knows who it is, but it's a very prestigious, high-priced lawyer. The lawyer for John Doe worked for Mueller and Comey and the FBI. Now, that doesn't mean it's connected to Mueller and Comey. I'm just saying, in terms of pedigree, this is not a random motion that you found some guy down the street to file because you gave him 500 bucks so he could make his rent. This is real, a real deal player, whoever John Doe is. So let's talk about Alan Dershowitz, who's swirled up in this. And I just wanted to point out something that I touched on earlier, which I got from one of the arguments. Uh, so both of these motions, respectively, the Dershowitz motion and Cernovich motion were denied. The district court's reasoning, which is available only in connection with the Cernovich motion, was grounded in two risk factors that are no longer relevant to the instant appeal, right? So the risk factors are, well, you know, we can't release the seal, we can't unredact these documents because, right? So this is from the, the brief. First, the court cited the privacy interests of the parties, which as detailed below, have been waived by Mrs. Guffrey. And even if Mrs. Uh, Ms. Guffrey had not waived her privacy interests, such interests are not sufficient to overcome the public right of access. Second, the district court reasoned that premature release of sensitive information could taint the jury pool in the upcoming trial. Ah, the famous taint the jury pool. I've heard that one a million times before. Right, so yeah. That's but the, right, risk, let's go. the, the, the right. case was settled, so there is no risk of tainting a jury pool. So what on earth, how on earth could that apply? Okay, great. So... Yeah, this is more adding to the procedural complexity. And actually, I was um, calling out Dershowitz on Twitter because he was trying to take credit for my case. Oh, yeah, and I, I saw spent that, yeah. Way too much money uh, and time on this for, for Dershowitz to come in. So Dershowitz had initially tried to get the records because Dershowitz, who was Epstein's lawyer, claimed that woman A, um, uh, Jeffrey or whatever, how you say her name, falsely accused him of being involved with Epstein. She he said that he was there, that he, as far as right. I understand it, he participated. And he said, no, 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 no. Right. Right. So he claimed, well, the records could clear him, but you don't really get to intervene in a case and get those kind of records. Right. So my my argument was the entire thing should be unsealed because it's a freedom of the press issue. We reporters have the right to dig through this and find out, is there an international sex trafficking ring? So then Dershowitz joined my motion, which caused me immense drama, and I get death threats to it to the day, because now the Pizzagators are saying that I'm working with Dershowitz. It's like, no, I filed a motion that is joined by the May May Herald, the Reporters Committee for the Freedom of the Press. Dershowitz joined mine. I wanted nothing to do with him. And then moreover, to add insult to injury, Dershowitz is out there trying to say, I filed this case and the Miami Herald joined mine because, you know, he's he wants a credit and egomania and everything else. But so he claims there's stuff in there that'll clear him. I don't care what what he thinks it'll do. That was never my theory. So when I, at the time that I had sued to get the records, the case was scheduled for trial. And if it, it was understood by the parties, if the case went to trial, everything would be public. And that's why they were able to settle the lawsuit for so much money, because whatever's in there, nobody wanted anybody to find out. I mean, it's, it, it, it seems so absolutely wrong, not just legally, but morally. The idea that you can somehow pay to get public filings redacted or, or that money. I mean, I, you know, we all have our cynical side and all of that. But that seems even beyond the pale for that.
Yeah, well, I'm a lawyer, so I'm just maybe too jaded or whatever. That's just the way the system works. And that's why – but th – so that's why the, the court said, well, I'm denying Cernovich's motion because we have a trial coming up and Cernovich is a loudmouth essentially, and he'll be all over Twitter sharing the documents and everything else, even though I wouldn't have. If they put me under a protective order, then I would have abided by it. But so and so what happened then is after after the settlement and then after the Miami Herald came in, uh, Jufre said, oh, no, release it. Go ahead. Just give him everything other than Social Security numbers and a couple sensitive details about a specific traumatic event. Give give everything over. And so the Miami Herald said, OK, well, the judge denied Cernovich's motion on the grounds that it could lead to, to pretrial publicity. And th those are all gone. Everybody's happy. Yeah, with there's, there's no need for privacy because it's been waived. The, the, right. the case has been settled, so there's no issue with the jury tainting. So release the hounds, right? Yeah, exactly. And the judge still denied the Miami, the Miami Herald's motion under the grounds that let a sleeping dog lie. Well, they settled the lawsuit. The lawsuit's over. That's that. No, no, no. It's, it's, this is absolutely bizarre. It, it is confounding. So the judge said, Cernovich, we're denying your motion because, you know, you're a loud mouth and we don't want you posting documents and leaking them to reporters and everything else before the trial. Mm. So then so now there's because the trial is going to be public. Well, now there's no trial. So then they go, oh, well, so the Miami Herald wants them. But, well, they settled the lawsuit and everybody um, agreed to keep things confidential. So we can't give you the documents because there was no trial. It's like, wait a minute. We can't give Cernovich the documents because there's going to be a trial. But we can't give the Miami Herald the documents because there was no trial. Well, and nobody has Catch the right, as far as I understand it, to say we want to keep things secret. You file in federal court or public court. I mean, the records serve First Amendment and common law out there for oversight into the judiciary process, which damn well seems to need it at this point, particularly with this lawsuit or with this case as a whole. Yeah, exactly. So it's a total catch-22. Cernovich can't have the documents because we don't want him to prejudice a trial. The Miami Herald can't have the documents because there was never a trial at all. And you're left there saying, what well, doesn't make any sense, which is essentially what the Second Circuit Court of Appeals said was, oh, come on, you have to you have to unseal some of them. And Maxwell's argument was, no, 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 the whole thing has to be sealed. And the court issued an order almost immediately after oral argument, which is unusual, and said basically, no, 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 like we're going to we're going to unseal this stuff. And then you had this last minute legal wrangling by people coming in, including this John Doe, who we don't know who he is. I suspect it's a member of British royalty, but we don't know. We, you know, we don't know. But it's somebody who's been in the papers and has been verified as being connected with this lawsuit. And that's where we are. Bizarre world. So, again, to give the scope of the seal, this is from one of the writs. This, this order effectively withdrew judicial and public oversight from the sealing process. In total, 167 documents, almost one-fifth of the docket, were placed under seal. Importantly, in addition to the wholesale sealing of certain motions, the entire body of the, depend, of the defendant Appley's motion for summary judgment, 68 pages, was redacted. And over half of the order denying defendant Appley's motion for summary judgment was redacted. So help me, I mean, I understand what a summary judgment is, but help me understand why that is so uh, crucial. Again, uh, so a, a motion for summary judgment is your best legal arguments that you file with the judge. And you, so you'll, you'll say there's a bunch of facts here, and then there's a bunch of law, and then the judge reads the motions and decides whether or not you're going to go to trial or not. It's uh, it's a judicial record. It's a public record. Nobody knows what's in there, though. No, nobody knows what's in there. That's again why everything is so literally confusing. I'm a lawyer. I've litigated cases. I've filed some, you know, written God knows how many motions for summary judgment. And even when I think about this case, I'm just thinking I'm I must be missing something. It can't be the case. Like everything with this Epstein the case is. It can't be the case that the entire thing was redacted. Sure, but it was. It can't be the case that the feds declined to charge him even though they had him. Well, it was. It can't be the case that he was let out of jail every day as a sex offender in Dade County. Well, it is. It can't be the case that every politician in Florida isn't rushing to take the stage for the greatest Me Too press conference moment in Florida history. But, but that is the case. That's literally every time you think about this is – what should be the case, it's the opposite of what, sh what actually is. Right. 
The Miami Herald did make a comparison between this issue with Epstein and the Catholic priest scandal that has been ongoing, of course, for, for decades. And here's a quote from someone. The real crime with the Catholic priests was the way they covered it up and shielded the priests. The orchestration of power by men only is protected as long as everybody agrees to keep it secret. This is a story the world needs to hear. So this is expensive, it's time consuming, it's stressful, it's difficult, it's, it can be very annoying. Help me understand what is driving you at the core regarding this issue. What do you hope to achieve in the long run? That's a complicated question because where I am is different from where I started off. Where I started off, I thought, it's kind of a wonky legal issue. Oh, this is a wonky legal issue. And at the time I had a Patreon, so I did a Patreon call with people. And I was like, hey, I'm, you know, because I don't use contributions to me to live off of. I live off of mindset stuff and, you know, my other businesses. So I was like, yeah, you know, we had something like, I don't know, 20 or 30 grand in the kitty. And I said, hey, you know, if you want to do this thing, it's kind of cool. Maybe there's something there, maybe it's not. And, and we did a conference call. And everybody said, yeah, this is a good use of $10,000. So, you know, I wrote the check, put the 10,000 and thought, sure, this is a wonky little legal issue. And then I found myself in a world that I didn't know that I was entering into, th this world of darkness. And now what drives me as much as anything is multi-layered. One is the idea that people really were harmed and somebody got away with it. Uh, that's just wrong at a, at a fundamental and human level. It's the kind of issue that if this isn't the hill you're willing to stand up and fight for, you know what what is? Because I let a lot of things off my back. I self-censor a lot. And, you know, you might hit a tripwire. There's all these things that I just shut up about now because one wrong word, you know, zero tolerance. They'll frame you for things, right? They'll say you never even said things. They'll, they'll edit things. And I said, but if this is what they're going to take me out for, if this is what's going to get me banned from the internet, then why am I even on the internet if I can't talk about this? So there there is a sense that this is this is something worth going after. This is a potentially international sex trafficking ring involving underage people. It doesn't get more serious than that. Yeah, I mean, I, of course, as, as we're both uh, fathers to two daughters and the idea that there are these kinds of people out there doing what they have done for God knows how long, right? I mean, by the time these people are caught, what they've been up to for how many years is something it's hard to contemplate without losing a hell of a lot of sleep. And then that they seem to wriggle free. I mean, this guy couldn't wriggle all the way free, right? They're, they're, this is a retired Palm Beach police chief, Michael Reiter, who supervised the police probe said, this was not a he said, she said situation. This was 50 something she's and one he and the she's all basically told the same story. Right. So if you can't get eyewitness times 50 to and physical evidence and plain locations and so on. If you can't get someone into jail for that, then there's no such, I mean, we might as well go back to having people grab rocks out of boiling water and see if the wounds heal, because then there's no such thing as a rational system of justice at all. And the, so he had to, he had to go down for something, but to go down in a way that further traumatized and abused a child by calling her a prostitute and uh, giving him all of these kinds of perks and, and so on. And, and now he can travel and he's enjoying his wealth. And I mean, it really is appalling. It's, you know, it's one thing with, with Hillary Clinton and how she seemed to kind of skate from, from a net that was, seemed to be kind of objectively or rationally closing in around her. And, you know, I get that, that national security is a big deal and people's lives are at risk. I get all of that. And it, you know, but, but here we've got children being scooped up in a sense off the streets, being, being bribed, being compromised, being corrupted. Some of them even being physically hurt, according to some of them that the, the activities would leave them sore for days, which is just absolutely appalling at any level. But with children, it, it just turns my stomach in a way that I, I can't even really express. And, and this fear that we all have that if you're rich and powerful and connected and you got the goods on people, you just live in a different legal universe. Like we all get the Democrat, Republican, like Dems don't invite, uh, sorry, Democrats don't uh, indict Democrats. And you know, if you wanna get away with bad stuff, just be on the left. But this even still is, is a whole other level. And you know, what chills me, Mike, is that I wonder if there aren't levels even above this, you know, where, where okay, this guy's relatively low hanging fruit compared to who, and I bet you, 
the other level, the level above this, two levels, five levels, 10 levels above this in terms of lack of accountability and just do what you want, I bet you those people are in those redactions. Yeah, and, and again, you a lot of points you touch on is one, I, I really made my audience mad when I said this two years ago. I never cared about Hillary Clinton's email server other than in a very intellectual level. It's a double standard and we all appreciate double standards, but there was no visceral locker up moment. She had the server. I'm like, ah, she's a scumbag. You know, wh whatever. I just never really cared. But this is children. This is a whole, a whole different level of emotion. And then intellectually, it's fascinating. I mean, you've been, it's like a puzzle. Like, wait a minute, you're, you're p connecting dots, but you're actually not the crazy person with the thumbtacks on the board and the strings. Like, no, these are all, you're not connecting weird dots. This is all real true. It is this puzzle. So who, how did Epstein make his money? Who was he working for? Was he working with? Was he an informant of some kind? W was he involved in intelligence operations and blackmail operations? What was really is fascinating. So it, and, and how far do these tendrils of power go? If this guy's got the goods, as, as you sort of talked about, the sort of theoretical ball of string you can bat around saying he's got cameras everywhere, and maybe he introduces some girl who looks older, and then he sits down afterwards and says, oh, here's the tape of you having sex with a girl who's underage, for which there is no defense in Florida law. I now own you. I can put a dog collar on, give me a leash, I own you. How many people did he have the goods on? How many people did he influence and who for? That is a truly staggering question. Right. And, and that's why you can't, we can't stop. We can't give up. That's another reason why I'm in it. There's, there's still too many unanswered questions. What am I going to do? Move on to the Mueller report or whatever <laughs> headline chasing. One, one benefit that you and I both have through the generosity of our readers and viewers and everything is if we if we want to spend a couple hundred hours and just really dig into something they're they're cool with that they're they're cool with us doing a long form investigative piece oh i've done and, like and, nothing yeah. compared to what you've done but two or three days sitting with this stuff with a barf bag by my side is like it's pretty pretty horrendous and we do have and you know so he may have fc may have something on everyone but you can be pretty sure he has nothing on mike and i that's that's one thing you can be absolutely so from here, I guess we'll talk about the end game in a sec, but from here, there's still motions and still stuff to file. You know, my particular concern, of course, is that, you know, oh, we lost the originals. I'm sorry, the redaction is all that's left. And oh, we don't know who signed it out. And it just seems there's a faint smell of smoke in the records room and we can't seem to find. Do you think that, that someone has already gone in and, well, you, who, who would know, right? You won't find out until you get further down this path. Yeah, and that's again why I'm grateful that the Miami Herald's in the case. It would if it were just me, I believe the documents would be have been lost. Oh, there was a flood, flood damage, water damage. You know how these things go. And that's why we should celebrate journalism when it's real and when it's done is. And, and that's why it's such a shame that the media has delegitimized itself with all these Russiagate conspiracy theories. We need trusted institutions as a country because you can dismiss me fairly or not, whatever, I'm, I'm, I understand the crit criticisms of me, you can dismiss me in a way that you can't dismiss the Miami Herald. There's 25 media outlets file the brief supporting the Miami Herald. Politico's on it, Every, everybody's got their eyes on it now. Everybody wants to know what's in there. So they, they can't just make them disappear. That, that'll be a huge, huge tornado that they're not, they're not ready for. But if it had just been me, yeah. They would have lost it, flood damage, or they would have stalled me for a year to try to bleed me to, to, to death on legal fees and whatnot. Right. All right. What lies ahead? And do you have, I mean, I remember you posting the other day on Twitter, I think this is regards to the criminal complaints against people who attack fans of, of you and so on. But um, you said, oh, the system, you know, be patient. It's slow. It does work eventually. Where do we stand? Uh, I always think of like a lawsuit, like you're walking up. A, a, a seesaw, you know, until you get to the middle and you go down, it sort of accelerates down the other side. Where are you in the process and how long do you think it'll take? And of course, the end goal being to try and unseal as much as possible. So what what should happen and based on how the Second Circuit has treated the case, what most likely will happen, there'll be an official order from the court demanding that the records be unsealed. And then it'll be kind of like a feeding frenzy where the Miami Herald is going to run to get that. And I'll just let them, you know, they, they can go first because it's going to cost a ton of money for the lawyers to go through and redact. 
So, oh, so the, after you get the unredacted, before you publish anything in the paper, lawyers got to go every comma, right? They got to go through every piece of paper. Yeah. So I, I don't, I don't have the budget to to spend a hundred thousand dollars for a lawyer to read, you know, every piece of paper on there. The Miami Herald, they do probably just barely, but they, they'll they'll go through it and kind of. Uh, get, you know, get the good stuff and, and start doing the work and they'll probably get a Pulitzer out of it. And if I'm lucky, I'll get a footnote uh, somewhere. But we know that we did the right thing. And in life, that's his own reward. I like how uh, in some of this stuff, there's like so and so lawyer and then journalist Mike Cernovich. It's like, you know, he's a lawyer, too. But I didn't want to say that. Right. So or they'll call me like, yeah, social media blog. It's funny. There, there were I was in the, the three different publications the same day. The Huffington Post goes. Pizzagate purveyor Mike Cernovich. And this is, of course, the same day that the Second Circuit Court of Appeals is siding with me. Politico goes, far right wing blogger mm. and filmmaker, but but we're, you know, okay, <laughs> it's a step okay. up, right? I can live with that. And then the Miami Herald said, social media blogger Mike Cernovich. And I even, um, I'm not going to name who, but somebody from a pretty prominent media outlet actually sent me social media blogger in quotes with kind of like a wink face because even, you know, journalists like, come on, I, whatever you think of me, and people don't, you know, people listening to me are here are a little bit more receptive, although I read the comments and that's not always the case. But even if you're mainstream, you don't like me, it's like, come on, dude, I, I did my thing here. I made my bones on this. Go beat me up next week. But you got to give me this win. No, I, I remember that the first time I was referred to. I mean, I was an entrepreneur, co-founded a company, grew it, sold it. You know, it was, I'm no Steve Jobs, but it was a pretty respectable showing for a, a kid from the, from the ghetto. And I just remember um, my, my CV was, was bandied about the first time I was written about in the mainstream media as I was just a former IT worker. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, Shakespeare, typist <laughs> or something like that. It's just, it's funny the way it works. But but, you know, and I just wanted to point out, you know, again, I mean, I, I'm as skeptical as you are about mainstream media, but I just say to people, if you go into the Miami Herald, turn off your ad block, man. They've earned it because yeah. they're doing great work here. And the thing that I really, really want to focus on as well, and we'll, we'll get to the end part in a sec, but imagine how horrible it is for these women. Imagine, like, you've been preyed upon, you have been uh, assaulted, uh, you have been degraded, uh, and, and you may feel like some of these women ended up uh, suicide, uh, drugs, a prison, I mean, just shattered. You are being preyed upon as a result of early trauma and being further traumatized by predatory sociopaths, in my humble opinion. And then finally, the cavalry right into town and like they're all going to come in and going to set things right and and you're going to restore your faith in your society and the good guys are going to win and the cops are going to give you a hug and and say how terrible and you can begin that process of healing and not feeling like your family was hell and then jeffrey epstein's place was hell and then your entire society is hell and there's no escape which is where i think some of this uh, drug use and suicidality may may come from and then what happens well, they cut a sweetheart deal. They don't consult you as they're supposed to. They don't give you the chance to respond as they're supposed to. And they don't even tell you when the sentencing's going on so you can show up and, and have your say. And then nobody picks yeah. up on it. Nobody talks about it. It's all buried. And this guy seems to skate off into the sunset while you're lying in a, in a heap of, of shame and, and post-traumatic stress disorder. And for these now women, I guess they're in their 20s and early 30s now, but for these women, for something just to occur, for something fair to occur, uh, you know, it would be such a, a boost for them, such a restoring of a healthy relationship to their society, such a, a, a load relieved from their bent backs. And, you know, ju just for that, I mean, I, I really applaud what you and the Miami, Miami Herald are doing, what Alan Dershowitz is doing to try and clear his name because you know, we can look at Jeffrey Epstein, it's terrible enough. We can look at all the people who facilitated this, terrible enough. But the girls need sunlight on this monstrosity. Yeah, they do. And, and adding to the story arc is it shows just anybody listening can try to make a difference, right? I was, in, I was the first one really pounding away at this case. And that's up to all of us um, as moral agents in this society is don't wait for someone else to, to do it. You have legally, obviously, you know, because they're so they twist everything we say. But 
yeah, we, we all have to do everything within our legal and ethical limits to, to make change in this world. Right. How can people help out what you're doing, Mike? They can go to Cernovich.com forward slash E-P-S-T-E-I-N, Cernovich.com forward slash Epstein. Look at all the filings. Kick in five. It ended up getting really expensive. It was not. It was supposed to be just a $10,000 thing. And every time there's more paperwork filed that just the legal fees really do mount. So it got really expensive fast. So yeah, people can kick in a few bucks. Great. Um, if not share the links, you, you know, share this video, share the articles, get the word out. Don't let the media write me out of this story. Don't let people lie about me and, and my involvement in it. That number of ways to do it and sound the alarm, get people excited and get people interested and let people know what's going on. I can't let you go without having you mention your book because a lot of people are kind of confused at how you get the strength of will and character uh, to, to do what you're doing against such significant odds. So give people a bit of a taste of, of how they can um, replicate and, and even expand on some of what you do. Well, sure. I always told people because I wrote Gorilla Mindset, which I think is how you found me many, many years ago. There's all these people who believe that I just came from out of nowhere and was like a Trump guy. I'm like, no, no, no. There's a like there's a whole my life is actually better when it was only Gorilla Mindset before I was <laughs> in this, you know, deep world of swamps with the, the monsters and everyone. But I, I wrote a great book on mindset and then I just showed people the principles applied to anything. You feel a little down now, you feel a little depressed, you feel a little insecure, boom, you got it. You have deep issues that you're not working on in therapy or maybe not helping you. I think you even said that it was better than 10 years of therapy or something like that for Gorilla Mindset or somebody said it's, that. It's a good book to read. For, I mean, I certainly recommend reading it. I've never done 10 years of therapy, so I can't really compare it, but it's it's a great book and I really, really do recommend that people, it's an easy read, uh, it's, it's a fun read and it's a powerful read. Yeah. And, and you can apply the principles to everything. It's just about where you want to lever up in your life. So if you're, you want to, you know, somehow you find yourself in where I am, which is just a really bizarre place. The principles are still the same. Are you, are you being mindful? Are you being present? Are you being aware of your emotions? How you feel checking in? Uh, it was their underlying stress that you're not aware of. Are you taking care of your body? I noticed I gained a lot of weight because I was not, you know, eating the proper diet. So Oh, and it, when you're on shows. the road, you basically just everybody turns into jab of the hut. It's hard to exercise and it's a lot. It's pretty easy to eat some some decent meals. Well, and you're hanging out with your friends, you know, like when you came down for the hoax premiere, we're all enjoying ourselves and, you know, Hollywood and you're having meals and appetizers. Oh, do you want dessert? Well, I usually don't. But sure. Why not? Because you don't want the night to end. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there was a lot of there was a lot of that. So it's kind of wild. 2019, we did hoax. Hoaxedmovie.com. And, and, and how is that? Uh, I was talking to John the other day. Uh, he says it's doing really well. And, and uh, I just, I mean, it's a great movie. People should just go and check it out. Hoaxed uh, everything you need to know about the fake news in, in order to stay alert in an increasingly deceptive world. Yeah. And you're in it. That's done, wait, we're at 104 countries now already. It's done, actually, I knew it'd do well, but it's doing about three times better than I thought it would. And I think it's actually going to go up because we haven't even got the, you know, you gave it a great shout out. Thank you. And Scott Adams did. We still haven't gotten the big shout out from Don Jr. yet and, and the media thing. And poor Jordan Peterson, he's in the movie, but he <laughs> sat for the film before he became who he is now. So I met, you know, he, when he was in Hoax, I was bigger than he was at the time. So he was like thrilled. Oh, I'll be in Cernovich's movie for sure. Right. He was really on the upswing. And now, you know, he's Jordan Peterson. It's a different thing. But I know the movie's great because and this is kind of a meta commentary on Hoax is I thought for sure the vultures would have circled Peterson and said, how could you have been in a movie with Cernovich? <laughs> He's such an evil guy. Molyneux in it. Look at these. The, but the movie is so good, they don't even want to make it. They don't outrage. even want to point people at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they don't. That's, and, and you guys should be very, very proud of that. Well, listen, thanks a lot for your time. I, I have been following this, and I, I'm really glad to get a more detailed and, and at the same time bigger picture view of this very, very important work. Uh, Cernovich.com, Guerrilla Mindset, and HoaxedMovie.com to check out Mike's a really, really great film. I really, really appreciate uh, this update and I hope you'll come back when the next development occurs. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for enjoying this latest free domain show on philosophy. And I'm going to be frank and ask you for your 
help, your support, your encouragement, and your resources. Please like, subscribe, and share, and all of that good stuff to get philosophy out into the world. And also, equally importantly, go to freedomain.com forward slash donate to help out the show, to give me the resources that I need to bring more and better philosophy to an increasingly desperate world. So thank you so much for your support, my friends. freedomain.com forward slash donate.